So it was about five minutes ago that I told you we would be starting in about five minutes. Uh, I used the term about very uh, uh, carefully, so I think I'm right on time. Uh, I hope you've had a, a good lunch and good lunchtime uh, conversations. I think the morning sessions uh, uh, have given all of us lots to talk about, lots to think about, uh, and, and, and lots, lots of new ideas and new, new issues to, uh, or new ways of thinking about old issues uh, to take back uh, uh, as you continue your work at home. Uh, we've got a couple of real treats coming up now, and I want to start with the first one of them. Um, I'm pleased to introduce to you Michelle Shearer, who's the 2011 National Teacher of the Year. This is quite a prestigious uh, honor, because there's only one every year, and they get better each year. Uh, I happen to have been at the uh, White House on May 3rd at the Rose Garden when Michelle was named uh, National Teacher of the Year and heard her uh, talk uh, uh, quite passionately and quite movingly about the work that she does. She is a high school chemistry teacher in uh, Urbana, Maryland. Uh, uh, she is also certified in special education. Uh, and I remember her talking about the work she had done to help deaf youngsters in Urbana learn chemistry. And it was quite impressive the way she talked about it. She comes from a family of educators, a family of teachers, correct? Your mother and father? Mother, okay, half of a family of educators. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that she brings a, a sort of a passion and an excitement and an insight to her work in the classroom. Uh, and uh, uh, all of the conversations we have been having uh, here at this meeting ultimately come back to the work that's done in the classroom, particularly our high school classroom. So please join me in welcoming Michelle Shearer uh, to uh, speak. All right, let me see if I can. There we go. I find myself right at home here. My mother is a retired music teacher. So music and uh, band have always been a big part of my life. So as long as I don't knock anybody's instrument off the chair, I think we'll be good to go. But I am Michelle Shearer. Thank you so much for having me here and allowing me to add some thoughts to the conversation about career and college readiness, and obviously speaking from the perspective of the classroom. So let's go straight there. If you look at the screens, this is my world. This is my classroom. This is AP Chemistry at Urbana High School, about 90 students. I taught last year in AP Chemistry. And many people will see this as sort of one of the stops on the way to being career and college ready. You know, the idea that if you're in an advanced class that you're learning the skills that you need to go on and it's kind of the culminating piece before our students move on. So this is a class of 10th through 12th graders. And when many people look at this picture, they look at it and they say, wow, that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of students in AP Chemistry. And yes, it is, but as, as teachers and as educators, we see a little bit more. I look at this picture and I see roughly a 50-50 mix of males and females. And that is a very good thing and that I think shows a lot of progress. I know from my um, growing up in the public schools, I had one female science teacher and that was in the sixth grade. So it obviously shows a lot of progress, but if you look at the picture, you also see, or I see, uh, that there is some diversity but not enough. Because in this classroom, there is not the diversity that reflects the diversity of our school population. And I don't think I'll ever be happy un until it is. I know that here in this organization, we won't be happy until it is. And I look at this picture, and I see students with a 504 plan, an IEP. And there will be people who will tell me that those students have no business being in my AP chemistry classroom, which, of course, I disagree. And so there's many things that we can glean from this picture, but people always come back to the numbers, the numbers, because this program over the past five years grew from 11 students to 33 students to 60 to 70 to 90. And they say, how do you do that? And when they say, how do you do that, often they're looking for you know, a strategy. That's the question, what strategy are you using? What program are you using? What book? What piece of technology? And what's interesting is that what I feel I use the most is none of those things. Actually goes back to um, my very first days of teaching. When I was a student at Princeton University, I was pre-med, and I had a transformational experience in a classroom with deaf students. And these are some of those students from the New Jersey School for the Deaf. 
And people asked me to describe that experience and what it was about it that was so powerful that made me scrap my plans to be a doctor and to commit my life to a career of classroom teaching. And it's very difficult to explain, but there was an energy in that classroom. There was a power. It was like a magnet that drew me. And, and I felt that I could really, really make that difference, to take everything that everybody wanted in a classroom and to actually make it happen with those students. And one of those things that those students taught me was to always think in terms of abilities and not disabilities. And that's something that I said in my White House remarks. And how important that is to see students and say they can achieve anything they want to achieve with our support and to believe that, not just to say it, but to believe it. And I was very fortunate to work with teachers at that school who believed that and who wanted for those students what they wanted for their own children, which I think is really the key. Which brings me to where I am now with my own child. That is my daughter, Carly, pictured with the boy she says she's going to marry. <laughs> and yes, as her parent, I want her to be, quote, college and career ready. And I put that in quotes for all of the reasons that we were just discussing on the panel today. That means different things to, to different people. And it's not just a program or a career, but really a set of ideas and skills that we all want our children to have. But um, what's interesting is I, I put up this picture to a lot of audiences, and, and this is a picture from Carly's preschool graduation. And thank you for not laughing, because you're the first audience who didn't laugh when I said that. And people will say, oh, you know, some people are laughing because it's just cute, and others will say, well, you know, that's so silly, you know, preschool graduation. But I mean, is it that silly? I mean, if our goal is to have children from all backgrounds and all walks of life be, quote, college and career ready and everything that that means. Is it so silly to have those little kids wear that cap and gown and to talk about what that means and to hold that piece of paper, not that the piece of paper itself has any value, but what it represents and the possibilities that it opens up for them for their future, be it a career or the military or college, whatever it is. Is it ever too early to start that process? And I think we've all agreed, again, listening to the panel, that the answer is no, in fact, that we need to start it earlier and earlier. So I had the opportunity last year to serve in my county, Frederick County Public Schools, Maryland, on the College and Career Ready Task Force. And this was a task force that brought together about 30 people representing uh, many, many different stakeholders. We had teachers, we had administrators, elementary, middle, high school. We had representatives from our career education program. We had people in the workplace who had graduated from our career education program. We had parents. We had uh, people who work with achievement gap warning organizations. We really branched out and tried to bring as many people to the table as possible. And obviously, with limited time, I can't go through everything we tried to do in six months. But basically, we were looking at our curriculum, our programs in Frederick County, and we were trying to decide, you know, is this giving our students what they need in terms of being college and career ready? And some of the questions we looked at. First thing we started to look at, you know, what do we teach? What do we want students to learn? And we said, you know, do our current programs address the governor's task force recommendations? That's one of the things that we were looking at. Is the high school program aligned with the Common Core standards and the recommendations of the Partnership for 21st Century Skills? So we were looking at our programs from that perspective. We were looking, if my clicker would respond, there we go, should specific courses in financial literacy be added to the program, beginning all the way down at the elementary level. That's something that we wrestled with. And also, should Algebra 2 be required for all students? And all would mean all. Students with special needs, all students, regardless of their you know, pathway. So we, we wrestled with a lot of these questions. What are we going to teach? What do students need to learn? But very quickly, we realized you know, we have to go beyond that. There's the teaching and the learning, but then there's also what is difficult to describe. I just call it the human factor. Somehow we've got to make this happen in our schools. We, it, it's not enough to just say, this is what we want to teach. This is what we think students should know. This is the right program. Somehow it's got to actually happen. And then we started discussing other questions. Are there sufficient recruitment efforts to engage students in academically intense programs? And let me speak to this one from experience. I teach AP Chemistry. My husband teaches AP Physics in the same high school. Okay? We have the program. The program's there. It's a good program. But that doesn't mean that students are just going to automatically sign up for it. I mean, we've got to go get those kids. 
You say, well, how do you do that? Well, there's lots of different ways that we do that. A lot of it is just one-on-one -on -one conversations with students. My husband, as department chair, literally travels class to class talking to students about what AP courses are, what they will do, the requirements that they need. We put up signs and posters in the hallway, in the bathroom, anywhere students will see them to get their attention. Somebody's got to bring the kids in. It's not enough to just have the program. And then, once you bring them in, you have to keep them there. Are there sufficient academic supports for students? And I know that when we think support, we often think, okay, tutoring, we need after school tutoring, we need extra help, extra time, yes, but we need more than that. We need members from the business community to come in and help students understand how these courses can be applied in careers. We need professionals who actually work in our fields to come in and help work with students. We bounced around the idea of bringing in retirees, people who just want to give back. I mean, there are people in the community who just want to give back. They're not teachers. They might not have students still in the educational program, but that's a resource that we felt that we could tap. And from the perspective of a classroom teacher, I find that it's not the academic support that's the problem. I mean, I can tutor kids on the content. It's, it's the heart-to-heart -heart human piece. You can do this. You can do this. Don't drop this class. I know there's 90, but I want all 90. I don't want 89. And those are conversations that have to happen on a daily basis. And then, of course, do teaching practices actively engage students in this intense coursework. And we've already heard on the panel things like you know, linked learning and the silo smashing that we all strive for. And the teachers of the year, when I say teachers of the year, I'm talking about 55 state and territorial teachers of the year that got together in Dallas and we came up with sort of a word map, a brainstorm of what do we need to be effective in the classroom in addition to the linked learning, and in addition to the silo smashing, and in addition to the great programs, and we came up with sort of this visual map of the different qualities that teachers have to have every day, all day, not just when it's convenient. Words like passionate, and loving, and caring, and committed, and energetic. It's that human piece, and we understand that it is not enough just to have a great program, that there's all these human characteristics that really make the difference as to whether a child believes that he or she is prepared for the future. We also realized in this task force that we don't talk to each other enough in a vertical direction. We realized one of the glaring things that came out of our six months of discussion is that we need better ver vertical communication, elementary, middle, high school, and into higher education. And we did have members of higher education on our task force, community colleges, four-year colleges, and we're all realizing that we don't talk to each other nearly enough. And this is a question that I get in various forms as I travel and I speak. They say, you know, you're a high school chemistry teacher, AP nonetheless. Why do you care about the education of young children? And it's interesting because when I repeat that question to others, they say, oh, yeah, that's easy. I mean, you have Carly, you have a daughter. You know, talk about it from the perspective of how important it is that your daughter is cut. But, you know, here's the thing. My daughter has an AP chemistry teacher for a mother, an AP physics teacher for a father. Be nice. <laughs> Two retired music teachers as grandmothers. I mean, my sister is a high school English teacher. My cousin is a middle school English language arts teacher. My other cousin is a first grade teacher. I mean, my daughter's covered. You know what I mean? She's, she's got the support. And again, it flashes me back in my mind to what I learned early on at the School for the Deaf, you know, to want for every child what you want for your own, that every child deserves that. So why do I care about the education of young children? Because I don't have an AP chemistry class unless down in the elementary years, that starts really early, the spark for science. You know, if, you don't, if we don't have elementary school kids getting their hands wet in a science lab and making bubbles and exploring and creating and asking questions, that doesn't just magically click in the 10th grade year. It's got to start early, and it's got to continue through middle school as we've been talking about these real experiences. You see these students in middle school, kind of hard to see from the slide, but, but they're holding strands of spaghetti, and they're kind of looking at each other in discussion mode. I mean, I know as a science teacher, they're either going to build bridges out of that spaghetti, 
with hot glue, or they're going to get together in teams with some gumdrops and see who can build the, the greatest tower possible, or they're, they're going to work on an engineering experience. And that's what really needs to happen, and it's great from our perspective when engineers come into our classrooms to do these types of things with students. And then, when they do, get to me in my classroom. You know, the interest and the skills and the foundations in place, but again, it doesn't magically happen without that human piece. And I spend a lot of time walking through this lab as I teach. And what's interesting is, I'm not walking through the lab clarifying content. What happens in the lab is students will be working on experiment and they'll call me over and they'll say, Mrs. Shear, I don't think this was supposed to happen. Is this, is this the right thing? And I'll say, I don't know. You're the chemist. What do you think? And they roll their eyes and, you know, give me a look, and, and I walk on, and I come back, and you know, they're, they're talking with a friend, and I'll say, well, did you, yes, yes, just go away, you know, yes, we figured it out. But to, to put kids in a position where they have to make decisions, where they have to be independent, I mean, there will be many students in the course of a lab who will, who will want to give up because they feel like it's not going right. And that's the time when you gotta walk by and you gotta say, you know, that's okay, that's what happens in science. You know, that's still a productive experience. It's, it's those, those one-on-one -on -one verbal exchanges, those are the things that students write to me about in the end. You know, or you said this, or you did this. And obviously, as a classroom teacher, we're on the front lines, and we're in there every day. But those conversations can happen outside the classroom, and that's where you need, really need to expand that dialogue. When people look at this picture, they, they look in the back on the tops of the cabinets and they say, what is that? What are you storing on top of your cabinets there? And I'm really not storing anything. What I have spread across the tops of my cabinets is a random collection of household items. Laundry detergent, sugar, shaving cream, sunscreen. Again, we were talking about that connection. Like, where is the connection to everyday life? So many times I have heard from students, why do I need to know this? What does this have to do with my life? And we have to add that piece. I absolutely 100% agree with that. And I have those visual reminders there every day and then that sparks the discussion and when a topic comes up they can relate it to everyday life. Because it, it starts very young. I've even had my own daughter at the first grade level ask me questions about content. Well, Why do I need to know that? And when am I going to use that? And it's not a question to be annoying. That's a valid question. Students should have a reason for what they're learning, and we need to have answers to those questions. But I think the biggest challenge in all of this, again, we can have the program, we can be great teachers, we can have it all mapped out, but perceptions of our students' abilities, I think, really holds us back. And let me just give you some quotes that I tend to hear. How can you teach chemistry to deaf students? there is an implication there that somehow deaf kids can't learn chemistry. And I'll tell you, that's not true because I taught for four years at the Maryland School for the Deaf and we did AP Chemistry and those students passed that exam. Okay, obviously it can be done, but there's the implication about how, and in fact, when I went to China, had the opportunity to visit China at the end of the summer, when this issue came up, the question changed from how do you do that to why do you do that? Which is, which is a, a whole interesting perspective and to our credit as a system, because we do believe that all students can achieve uh, their highest potential. So that was an interesting discussion to have. This is a question I was asked in one of my very first TV interviews. Aren't AP chemistry and special education polar opposites? Meaning you can't have one with the other. And of course we shake our heads and we say, you know, that's come on, but we, but we have to do it. We have to bring in those students. And I have had students in my AP chemistry class with Asperger syndrome, with dyslexia, with dysgraphia, with low vision, who are in there and they're succeeding along with everybody else. It can be done and we've got to prove it. This one will speak to everybody here. What's he doing in AP Chemistry? Isn't he in CTC? And of course, CTC in our kind of career tech center. It doesn't he go to the career tech center. Again, piggybacking on the conversation from the panel, that we've got to break away from this or philosophy, this college or careers. It's college and careers and careers. And when I was on the task force, I heard from some, some CTC students who said that they did not feel valued by their home school as, as being a CTC student. And that's something that really needs to change. Uh, it's always wonderful to have an example. And last year I had a student who graduated as a senior who was a phenomenal student in our CTC program. In fact, went to the national um, championships in his area and also earned a five on the AP chemistry exam. There, there is an and. 
there is an and. And I remember, again, back to this human piece, there was a point in time where I wasn't really sure if he was going to stick with my class or not. He was uh, exceeding at an amazing level, but I knew he had other commitments at CTC. And I actually had that heart to heart with him. You know, how you do? You know, you're really great with this. You're great with this chemistry stuff. And, you know, what do you plan to do in the future? And he told me what he planned to do. And frankly, what he planned to do didn't have a whole lot to do directly with chemistry. But he's like, oh, no, I love this class. I love what I'm learning in this class. I'm getting so many skills. And he stayed, and it, and it really made all the difference. We've got to have that changeover. And this is the one that I think bothers me the most. Why don't you weed out the weak students? There is still often a perception that these advanced high-level courses are for some students and not others. And as an AP teacher, Sometimes there's this perception, well, let's bring them all in, let's find, let's bring in those 92 students, and after the, after the second week, you know, you make it hard enough and brutal enough that, you know, you sort out who really deserves to be there and who doesn't. But how can we know in the first week or two of a class who deserves to be there and who doesn't? I mean, students come to the table with a host of different skills, and, and who a student is in August may not necessarily be who that student is in May. And that's what you have to believe in. And I tell my students that on the very first day of class. Again, this little human piece, I tell them. I say, I know that there are some of you sitting in here who probably don't feel that your skills are, are up to where they need to be to do this. But you've got to give yourself time. And you can't compare yourself to the person sitting next to you. And it, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Everybody's working towards the same goal, but there's a long time to get there. And again, students will tell me sometimes that alone makes all the difference. I mean, I think the real question is, do we really believe I mean, let's be honest, do we really believe that all students, including our English language learners, including our students with special needs, that they really can all be college and career ready? And I would say that right now where we, the general we population, the answer is no. And I know that because of the questions that I get. And I know that public perception and, and, and negative stereotypes are the hardest thing to change. Anything is easier than that. But I would argue that that's really where we need to start, is, is latching onto some of these perceptions and, and just hammering away at them and proving and proving that they don't hold water and that students can do so much more than that. Perceptions, from our perspective as adults, also looking at perspectives of students, or perceptions of students about themselves. If we look at these pictures of these little faces, these little uh, students in their lab goggles, you know, Ask a, a young student to draw a picture of a scientist and see what they draw. Do they draw somebody from their own ethnic group? Do they draw a man or a woman? How is that person dressed? What setting do they put? That's going to tell you a lot. I mean, there, there are perceptions that our students have about themselves where, where they don't necessarily see themselves in a particular role, whether it's science or the arts or a particular career because of certain perceptions that they've already acquired. And, and if we don't get to that, then we'll never get them here, which again is into a class like mine, where maybe perhaps they actually believe that, hey, I could be a scientist too. But even when you get them here, we've already discussed today that some students, a lot of students don't even know where to go from this point. Like, yes, I'm, I'm a good academic science student, but what does that mean in the real world? Like, what are, my, what are my job possibilities? What does a chemist do? They're often very surprised to hear me say that I met a chemist once when I was traveling in Italy, and his job was to work on the chocolate on Baby Ruth candy bars. That was his job, to come up with a, with a better version of chocolate that didn't melt as quickly. And my students are like, really? That's, that's a scientist? Yes, that's a scientist. I mean, I have a student who went on to become a chemical engineer and worked for Procter & Gamble, and he worked on uh, baby wipes, improving baby wipes. I mean, all these products that we use in our everyday life, that's chemistry. And then, of course, the discussion branches out to physics and biology and to any other realm that they might be interested in. But even when you get these high-performing academic students, they often really honestly don't know what's next and what that looks like. Unfortunately, we're talking about perceptions of students, our perceptions, and let's go real big here in the broader picture. I will have people say to me, Michelle, really, what's the point? And they'll say, this is nice. Yeah, congratulations, you have 90 students in AP Chemistry, but what's the point? And the next point that they make is, how many of those students will actually go on to be chemists? Three? Five? And they say, now, come on, Michelle, face it, really. How many of your students are ever going to remember, let alone use, the facts and formulas that you teach them? 
And that's a point that I'll concede. I'll say, you know what, you're right. You're right, many of them, most of them probably won't want to be chemists, and many of them won't ever remember any of the facts and formulas that I teach them. So it's a darn good thing that I teach a lot more than facts and formulas. And then of course this, and when I say I, I'm speaking for all teachers. Often as teachers, we are associated with the subject that we teach, with the content that we teach. You know, you're a chemistry teacher, you're an art teacher, you're a music teacher. But we're all teaching the same thing. I was at an event in Delaware uh, two weeks ago, and a middle school art teacher came up to me, and he said, oh, I just wanted to meet you because you teach what I teach. Because we teach the same things. Creative problem solving, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, not to mention Qualities like independence, self-direction, self-confidence, resilience, adaptability. I mean, this is what we teach. And this is, as the discussion has shown today, what we know we need to teach if our students are really going to be prepared. That's the point. Um, just to close up, I, I was in China, and a very interesting discussion there. People ask me all the time, well, how was China? What did you learn? Well, it was not what I expected. Uh, you know, we associate China with high test scores. Uh, I was prepared to have that discussion. I'm an AP chemistry teacher. I'm certainly no stranger to testing. They didn't ask about my scores, and uh, I didn't inquire about theirs. They were very, very interested in everything that I just talked about. How do you promote creativity? How do you create independent thinkers? Because they're at a point where they realize content knowledge, while important and essential in any content area, is not enough to prepare their students for a global society. And so they were extremely interested to hear about what we're doing here in terms of preparing all students for a better future. I uh, had a chance to look into some of their classrooms. This is an example of a middle school science classroom. You might be wondering what those little yellow things are on the table, their little individual fume hoods. But one of the things that, that they're looking at is, you know, they, they've had this very traditional method of instruction. Again, where students do get pigeonholed into one track or another. And they are realizing that that is just not working and they're looking for something better. And interestingly enough, we're looking to us. So in closing, the very big picture. And I think for all of us, wherever we work in education, Sometimes it's hard to keep focused on the big picture and what really is the point, the big idea. I know that even as a classroom teacher, very easy when I get into school to get caught up in the, I gotta make my copies, I need this meeting, and, and just to get caught up in the in the day to day, you lose sight of what the big picture is already always about. So many, many years ago, I decided never to use my bulletin board for an announcement, a schedule, but that I would cover my bulletin boards with the faces of students. And this is one of the bulletin boards from my classroom with pictures of students that goes back well over a decade. It's one of three bulletin boards that I have. There are students from the Maryland School for the Deaf who have gone on to graduate four-year programs, do amazing things. There are students who have become scientists. There are students who have become artists. There are students who have become teachers. And I put, I put the pictures on the board to help keep myself grounded and focused, but also so that my current students can start again to see themselves. See themselves, because they'll look at a picture and they'll say, oh, I knew him, and I'll say, really? He's a chemical engineer. And they'll say, really? And I'll say, yes, and then we'll get a dialogue going about you know, what, what was the track that that student took, and maybe that's the path that they could take. So whatever the method, and this works for me, to always have pictures of students, I think the most important thing that we need to realize is, is A, it is all about the students. And it's easy to get caught up in other things and forget that. B, all students deserve to have rigorous educational preparation, whether that is for the military, a great career, college, whatever. And of course, most importantly, to always want for all of these students what we would want for our own children. Thank you so much. It's been great to be here speaking with you. Appreciate it very much. Michelle, thank you just so much for uh, that wonderful, wonderful uh, reminder, really demonstration of what an awesome teacher can do to produce awesome results with the kids in our public schools, with a diverse group of kids. That is just fantastic. So I wanna, wanna thank you for, for what you're doing in Urbana. Frankly, if I still had kids who were gonna be in high school, I'd be moving to your school. Uh, so th thank you so much for what you're doing for our kids and thank you for bringing those insights to us. Uh, we now have... You've just 
heard an awesome teacher. You're about to hear from some awesome kids. Uh, these uh, uh, young students are from the uh, uh, DC KIPP Academy. They are from the um, Honors Orchestra. Uh, I'm going to introduce in a moment Dawn Johnson, who is the uh, orchestra director. Dawn, where are you? Where you are? Good. Uh, we're going to hear a, two brief pieces, uh, and I think one student is going to have a few words to share with us, but please now uh, join me in welcoming Dawn Johnson and the KIPP Orchestra. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm Dawn Johnson, and I'm the orchestra director at Kip DC Key Academy. We are all very excited to be here today to perform for you all. This is actually their inaugural performance for their school year. Um, they're very excited, a little anxious, a little nervous. Um, we're going to be performing two pieces for you today. The first piece is called Hey Fiddle Fiddle. And the second piece is entitled Rhythm in Blues. Um, we will also have a student speaker um, by the name of Akaya Evans. Where are you, Akaya? Akaya Evans is going to be our student speaker who's just going to speak to you briefly about what it means to be a KIPP student, what it means to work hard, um, and embody all of the qualities and the character traits and the skills that all of our KIPP students embody to help themselves get to and through college. So please enjoy our performance for you this afternoon. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon. 
I am Akaya Evans and I attend KIPP DC Key Academy. I am an eighth grade student and I have been attending Key Academy for three years. I have to say, being a KIPP student has been the best experience of my life. It has opened many doors, presented me with many opportunities, and taught me the true meaning of hard work. When I became a KIPPster in the sixth grade, I struggled academically. By increasing the amount of time I spent studying, asking my teachers for extra help, and having a whatever it takes mindset, I was able to improve my GPA from a 3.48 to a 4.09 by the end of my seventh grade year. Playing the violin of Vivace has taught me self-discipline, given me a greater appreciation for music, and shown me what it looks and feels like to perform in concert halls. With every note that I play on my instrument, I know that I'm being held to high expectations, and I work my hardest every day to exceed those expectations. At Key Academy, the school day is extended, homework takes a little longer to complete, and attending summer school is mandatory. But I appreciate every moment of extra time I have to give my education because I know that it will, help, that it will all help me achieve my dreams of attending Harvard University and becoming a very good lawyer one day. That was awesome. <laughs> Just awesome. Thank you for that. If, if this is what you can do in the beginning of the year, I want to come back and hear you at the end of the year. <laughs> Just a reminder. Just a reminder that excellent comes, excellence uh, and performance comes in all different fields, and they're all important, and we value them. Uh, all. My, uh, I have a son who is a musician and an instrumental music teacher in uh, uh, charter schools outside of Pittsburgh. 
Uh, I wish you could have been here uh, to hear this. Uh, and someday he'll be able to direct students to do every bit as well as you do. So thank you again for that. So we now uh, come to the afternoon portion of the, uh, of the agenda of the day. We have two different sessions that are coming up. And I want to take a minute to explain them to you, because this is the last time we are together until the end of the day at no, we're going to be together for the reception, Alyssa. Right, it's the last time we're going to be together again at a reception at 5.30 uh, uh, out in the hall there. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, drinks and enough food so that you may not actually need to go to dinner tonight. Though you're more than free to if you want, but it'll be an opportunity to, uh, for us to get together, to uh, network informally, to talk with each other and to catch up. So that will be the next time as a group uh, we are at least physically in the same place. Immediately after this session, uh, we have two different sessions coming up. Uh, one is an opportunity for you to be in peer groups, in role alike groups. And you look on the, on the agenda and you'll see the variety that we have for higher ed leaders, uh, for state education department staff, for chiefs, for others, right? This is an opportunity for you to spend some time with people in other states who are addressing the same issues you are. We've identified in each of those groups a couple of, of, of people from those roles uh, and asked them to start out the discussion with a few, a few comments and a few thoughts to get the ball rolling. But this is an opportunity for everybody to participate, uh, share what you're doing, share what you're learning, share your challenges uh, with each other. Uh, after that, uh, there's an opportunity for state team time. And I want to really encourage you to use that time uh, well, in many states, uh, you're a somewhat new group of people. You've not necessarily been working together for years on these issues. In other states, you have been. But this is an opportunity for you to come together as a state team. Uh, we've, we will have facilitators there. And we've got a guided, dis guided instruction uh, discussion for you that is basically designed to help you pretty quickly take stock of where you are and think about the work that you need to do next in your state. So I think it's a really important opportunity for you to pull together the things that you've been hearing and discussing and learning at this meeting, the issues that you've got on your plate in the state, and begin to think through what's next in a really focused and action-oriented way. So you'll have those two sessions, the roll-alike sessions, the state team time. Your agendas are, should be pretty clear about where each of those sessions is meeting, and then when you're done with that, please join us in the, um, uh, in the lobby outside for, um, uh, for our reception. And then tomorrow morning, we start back here again at what time, Alyssa? Breakfast at 7. Oh, that's right. Breakfast is, starts at 7. We work you hard at these meetings. We start early, we go through the day, and then we send you home. You're only here for a little over a, you know, a day and a half or so. But breakfast tomorrow, we have a keynote speech at 7.30 uh, with Bob Corcoran from the GE Foundation. I don't know if any of you were at the uh, Education Commission of the States meeting earlier this summer. Did a phenomenal job there. Bob is deeply committed to the work that you're doing, both personally and the GE Foundation. Supports a fair amount of Achieves work in this area. So I think you will find him a really uh, in insightful, important speaker uh, about how the business community can really play a role in the work that you are doing and supporting that work. So again, two sessions uh, this afternoon, uh, a reception uh, back here tomorrow morning, uh, 7 for breakfast, 7.30 for the uh, keynote address by Bob, and we'll roll through the rest of the program then. So thank you very much. We'll see you at the next session.